on June 20th, 2021, the day of the summer solstice, Ancestral Artworks launched its latest work, its latest creative production, The Resurrection of Truth from the Chains of Falsehood, retold by Dr. W. Joy Hardiman. That's me. It was an exciting launch. And what you're about to see is an edited version of that launch. Sit back, enjoy, and, and be there with us as we celebrate this new birth are gathered like this for a beautiful launch, a new project, a new creation that's among us, that has come to guide us even further to our truth. It is so appropriate that we should pour libation and remember that there are those who come before us. And let us all, as we are here today, remember our own ancestors, those who fought, those who stood up, those who made sure that we could be here today and have very productive lives. And with that, I say, Ashe, 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 Salma Hardiman, everyone, who really made today possible. Thank you. Yes. My mom is going to be uh, coming up and she is going to tell you a tale that I have known since the day I was born and you get to experience it from her mouth uh, the way that I do. So Dr. Hardiman, Mummy, Lucy, you want to come on up here? Come on, Ricky. All right, let's do it. <laughs> As a child, I was into Once Upon a Time. I believed that the prince would come and carry me off to a castle someplace in the sky. I believed that many of the men I met were, met were frogs, and if I kissed them, they would turn into princes, and princesses, or whatever, that they would turn into something very, very magical. My life wasn't based on Once Upon a Time, and that was a reality that, that didn't have anything to do with me, that it was a Western construction of living happily ever after, and that there was a world before Once Upon a Time. There was a world in which, that we called the first time, and in the first time, there wasn't this kind of division, there wasn't this kind of binaries, there wasn't this kind of little girls not liking their bodies because they didn't, they didn't look like Barbie dolls or because, they, because their hair didn't and flip and flop all over their faces. Once upon a time, and the first time, people loved their hair, they loved their skin, they loved their bodies, they loved each other, they loved their families, they loved their children, they loved their community in the time before Once Upon a Time. My name is Dr. Joy Hardiman. Um, my students called me Dr. J. Some people call me Mama Joy. Some people call me Joy. Um, some of you I have known for a very long time. Some of you have become new friends in, in my life. Um, but I feel that I am in a happy place. I am in a family place. I am in a sacred place. Um, and I am so pleased to be with you. Most of Western literature has its prototypic roots in ancient Egypt. Come on. Boom! I was gone. I was free. I was free because at that point everybody knew what all the research was talking about how ancient Egypt, whose real name is Kemet, was in fact the classical black civilization. And so I studied the classical black civilization and I studied the literature. And what I discovered was a worldview, a worldview that was very different from the Western worldview. A worldview that was not based on either or, but it was based on both and. A worldview that was not based on linear, sequential, you're gonna do, if you don't do it now, it's never gonna be done. Everything has a beginning, middle, and end, and after the end, that's it. I found a worldview that was cyclic, that said it goes around. What comes around goes around. A world that says if you didn't, can't get it this time, that's okay, because you can get it the next time it comes. You know, a worldview that understood that there was no separation between the spiritual and the material. And when we separated the material and the spiritual, we died. A worldview that saw human beings as verbs, as developing, as potentially okay. Nobody was ever lost. They were only a prodigal son or daughter that needed a pathway home. Mm. That worldview led me to the truth. What? 
and it led me to, 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 to trying to look and find out how do I, how do I get away from the, from the, from the worldview of falsehood that, that is dominating us now and move into a world of truth and not only move into that world but create that truth in the world. And so I found this story, uh, and the story was, uh, was called the, uh, the, uh, the story of the two brothers, and it was about the triumph of truth over falsehood. And then I read about the legends of Asar and Aset, um, w that we commonly know as Isis and Osiris. And we get the same thing of the two brothers fighting, but ultimately the, 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 the resurrection of Osiris, the resurrection of truth. And I saw those stories, and I said, I have to start telling that story. So I told the story of truth and falsehood, and I've told it many places. I've told it in Kenya at Mbogo School. I stole, I've told it in Cameroon. I even got to tell it in Cameroon at the Palace of the King. Um, in the middle of the night, I told the story. And, and I've been telling this story and thinking I really needed to, to publish it uh, or do something with it, um, but it was still, it, was, it, 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 it wasn't complete. And how it got completed was about two years ago, I was at a conference. Um, Anita, can you get the flowers? Uh, I was at a conference, and um, Arisha Day had a roots conference, and I was telling the story of truth and falsehood. And I was really happy about telling the story. And, um, and then I came to the end about how the people had grabbed truth and brought truth back to the universe. And, um, and, uh, and I said, are there any questions and answers? And, and a young person, one of our, one of our village geniuses, um, said to me, uh, so, uh, so now that you've got truth back in the world, how do you keep it there? <laughs> back to the drawing table. So I want to recognize her right now. I want to, I want to, um, Benithia, can you come up here, please? I want to present you with this bouquet of flowers. Because of you, kind of rewrote my whole thing. And I, and I also wanted to give you the flowers because I think it's really important for us as elders to listen to our young people, to hear their questions, and to respond as best we can. This book is about the resurrection of truth from the chains of falsehood. And you notice I use the word raw resurrection. All right. That's a really important concept that I have, um, that I've been working with for, for a while. In this book, you will notice oftentimes I use the word ra. I use that ra as the, instead of the Latin meaning for, 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 for re, all right, I use the comedic word for re. So, 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 so in, the, if in the Western world, uh, we, we will re, we, 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 we will replace. We will retain. We will recover. But re in the Western world, the prefix in the Latin prefix means to go around, to come back, to come back to the center. And um, but if we look at it, look at it with the meta netter prefix, re means ra or the sun. All right. So so what what so what what the book suggests. If, in fact, we're going to move into the world of truth, we need to start thinking about ascension as opposed to repeat, repeating. And that's something that you can do as a little exercise with yourself. If you find yourself kind of stuck in a place, listen to your words and take all your re-words and make them raw words, and they'll make a difference. That's right. The raw resurrection of truth from the chains of falsehood. An ancient comedic ancient Egyptian wisdom text. The before word. I take as my sacred duty to restore that which is in ruin and to raise up that which is unfinished, to overthrow that which has been made by those who ruled in the ignorance of Ra. Oh. Nitsi Bitti Hetshetsup, 1507-1458, BCE 18th dynasty. Ashe o. Before once upon a time there was the first time, and the first time was called Satepi. And during the time of Satepi, truth walked in a world that was harmonized by Mayat, by justice, by divine order, by balance, 
and by reciprocity. When truth walked the world, people knew there was no separation between the spiritual and the material, and that what was above was also below. People saw things as holes rather than as parts, and understood that life was cyclic and not linear, and what goes around comes around. They understood that, rep rep that redemption was always possible and that human beings were verbs and not nouns when truth walked the world. When truth walked the world, things were in balance and truth and falsehood were seen as complementary dualities, two sides of the same coin. When truth walked the world, people were not victims. Each one in their own way was a victor. No one was a stranger. Everybody was somebody's brother, sister, daughter, son, mother, father, or friend journeying home. But over time, truth sibling, falsehood, became jealous of truth. Falsehood did not want to share. Falsehood wanted all of the attention, all of the admiration, all of the praise, all of the power. So, falsehood thought and thought and thought. Finally, falsehood decided there was only one way to gain world dominance, and that was to destroy truth. Falsehood hid behind a tree and waited patiently to ambush truth. When falsehood walked by, falsehood, when truth walked by, falsehood grabbed truth, threw truth to the ground, stepped on truth's throat, muzzled truth's mouth, chained truth's hands, and kicked truth into a deep, deep pit. <coughs> and then falsehood put on truth's clothes and boldly began to walk throughout the land disguised as truth. Oh. The earth shuddered and shuddered. The earth shuddered in horror and Mayat and Harmony disappeared. Everything turned upside down. Isfit and chaos began their reign. All right. Falsehood's followers put on their battle gear and came to conquer. They turned language into a weapon. Mm. They problematized the other. They created binaries. They divided the world into either or and small and lonely places in between. Both and was replaced by black versus white, us versus them, rich versus poor, straight versus gay, old versus young, fat versus thin, Christian versus heathen, able versus disabled, light skin versus dark skin, love versus hated, wanted versus rejected, and worthy versus unworthy. Uh -huh. And people began to lock their doors so that the other could not get in. And as they locked their doors, they locked their hearts. And as they locked their hearts, they locked their minds. And as they locked their minds, they locked their souls. Fear and anger became dominant modalities. Pathology became a description. Trauma became generational. Money became God. White became right. Social media became the gospel, and the big lie ruled the land. This is a book for contemporary times. This is a book that describes where we are and what is going on in our lives, and it is a book that is about now.
Not only am I committed to this notion of um, searching truth and restoring that which is in ruin and making it more beautiful than before, and, and I've really dedicated my life to that, whether I'm in a classroom with my students trying to make them more beautiful than before, whether I'm doing artwork, you know, and plays and productions are usually about truth and false and making something more beautiful than before. But one of the things I also um, want to leave as a legacy is someone who always acknowledged the next generation, who always reached back. I'm totally committed to the intergenerational transfer of knowledge and I just want to acknowledge that in the production of this book um, uh, everyone who worked with me was in the next generation um, I want to acknowledge um, uh, 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 the, um, uh, the, the the illustrator who is with a young woman from Venezuela um, who was fleeing her country because of um, they bombed her uh, university so when she does pictures of when falsehood comes into the land and the bombing they're coming from her own real experience and so so that, was, so that was my, my kind of um, South American intergenerational collaboration around the book. The editor of the book, all right, is from Ni Nairobi, Kenya. Her name is Abigail Orunga. And she is next generation, and she edited the book because I thought it would be really great to have a book about ancient Egypt with a drawing by a South American uh, refugee to be um, to be um, edited by uh, someone who had gone to English schools um, and had perfect English grammar uh, in Africa, and that's where I went to get perfect grammar was to Africa. So I like that notion. I like that notion. Kylan Oliphant, genius, designed my uh, web page. That the publishers are two uh, African American brothers. So everything in this book is either intergenerational or, or it's African descendant. So I would like you to buy the book from the Curry Brothers rather than from Amazon, because I don't want Amazon to get no money. But you can get it if it's a death. But, but let's try. Let's, let's, let's keep the money. I want the money from this book to go around in the community at least once or twice. So I feel, feel really blessed that uh, Tracy Harville introduced me to the Curry Brothers. Nia Aranga has been my project coordinator um, for um, you know, right, and it's hooked me up with these amazing young people, talent people, so I want to take my hat off that. And then also, of course, my daughter, you know, um, who is, um, who is everything, everything. And so, remember, if you'd like to buy a copy of the book, you just have to go to Amaz no, go to ancestralartworks.com because we want to buy it through the webpage and so we can get it through the black publishers so we can spread money in the community. Also, there is a copy of the book um, that I got from Kinko's today because I decided uh, the book, I didn't have a hard copy coming. I want to make sure everybody signs the book. So we're reversing. Normally the author signs. In this situation, I want the village to sign. And so this book will be a book that I will put on my altar to remind me of the blessings and of the love that I have from this community and the work that everyone. So again, I want to thank the host. I want to thank my daughter, who's the event planner. I want to thank everybody who's coming. I want to thank Yangi, who's grown up to be a beautiful young baby. I, she's grown, gotten so big. I just want... I love this intergenerationality of us all and my Camerons and my Mexico buddies and my Black Arts Arts buddies and my buddy, 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 buddies. I just, um, I'm just really uh, 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 thankful for you all to come. Please buy the book. Please tell other people to buy the book. This is a story that needs to be told, particularly now. We really need, use it, buy it for book clubs. Have people sit and talk about it. Buy it for your families. Have everybody figure out what falsehoods are controlling them and make a vow as a family and community to spend that year busting the thing. Let's take it into our schools so that we can talk about the history that our schools have never taught us. We can take one page and teach, do a whole curriculum based around that but the story has to come out it is our duty it is our sacred duty to restore that which is in rune and do what I say I say I say let's go do our work all right thank you want to know more about the raw resurrection of truth from the chains of falsehood, or if you would like to buy a book, 
go to ancestralartworks.com. Again, ancestralartworks.com. And if you happen to be in the Seattle area, I'm going to be at Emoja Fest selling and signing the book. So come on down this Saturday, Emoja Fest. Stop by my stall. Let me share with you my story. Hotel. And remember, like, share, subscribe, and buy my book.